Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the process of becoming a remote viewer. My guest, Lori Williams, is a professional trainer of remote viewing. She is the author of two books, one on monitoring and the other a how-to guide called Boundless. She is also the CEO and founder of Intuitive Specialists located in Mountain Air, New Mexico. Welcome, Lori. Oh, thanks for having me, Jeff. I'm really, really excited to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, you've been working in the field of remote viewing now for well over a decade. I'm guessing close to 20 years. No, more than that. Actually, more? since 1996. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's how old I am. I see. I see. So, <laughs> <laughs> that would be over 20 years. Yes. In, in, indeed. And prior to that, you have a background in hypnosis. Actually, uh, my background in hypnosis came from my remote viewing experience and made me very interested in that. I was a social worker and a missionary most of my life, and then I discovered remote viewing after coming back from the mission field of South America. And the study of consciousness, which is really what remote viewing is all about, fascinated me so much that when 9-11 happened, my the place I was working looked like it was going to go out of business because so many nonprofits went under after 9-11. Um, the anthrax scare, you know, kept a lot of reimbursements coming from grants and things, and many nonprofits shut their doors. And I was a recently singled new single mom. Oh. So um, it was suddenly my boss was like, you better find something to fall back on. So I decided to go to hypnosis school, and I opened up a hypnosis business in Amarillo, Texas, that thrived for 14 years until we moved to New Mexico and closed it down. I I see. So that all happened after you got introduced to remote viewing yes. all at once. But to be fair, as I understand it, you have a long history of having had psychic experiences. I do. And sometimes I, I hesitate to talk about those things because I want your listeners to be aware that you don't have to have had any kind of prior experiences of, in the supernatural or paranormal to learn how to remote view. In fact, some of my best remote viewers have had no experiences mm -hmm. prior to studying it uh, because it was designed by the U.S. military to be able to teach, you know, pull a, let's pull a grunt off the front lines and teach him how to, how to access his psychic ability or her psychic ability. But yes, I do. I have quite an extensive experience of unusual mm -hmm. happenings. <laughs> I mean, I know there are remote viewers, particularly those who come out of the military, who insist they are not psychic and they don't do psychic work. <laughs> yes. My friend, Bevy Yeagers, who ran the U.S. Psy Squad and was mm -hmm. a dear friend of mine and Lynn Buchanan's, she used to say, I'm about as psychic as a bag of rocks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember Bevy Yeagers well. In fact, many years ago, when she was still alive. I interviewed her. Uh, she's a lady who uh, maybe she's about as psychic as a bag of rocks, but I, <laughs> as I recall, she earned a $60,000 commission uh, helping uh, one of her clients uh, forecast coffee futures. She sure did. And it, she with the, he bought her a beautiful home because back then, I think $60,000 bought a gorgeous home yeah. in uh, St. Louis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, I remember being so quite impressed by that. She's myself. a hero to many people. <laughs> she is. Yeah. And she was a dear friend of mine. Um, I met Bevy, I think, I, well, I saw her on TV first. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she was always on the <clears throat> Travel Channel, and they always did a lot of documentaries with her in them, find, helping, leading the police to bodies and many different things. Yeah. Um, and Bevy had such, you know, an interesting background uh, in police work and mm -hmm. detective work and psychic ability. And financial forecasting. And financial <laughs> forecasting. And and Bevy ended up uh, somehow, we met at a con the very first remote viewing conference ever mm. that took place in 1999 at the Inn of the Mountain Gods uh, out, outside of Ruidoso, New Mexico. I see. And uh, that's where I think I met her the very first time. And uh, Well, your training in remote viewing came from Lynn Buchanan. That's right. And Lynn was a former trainer in the unit, in the mm -hmm. top secret psychic spying unit. Yeah. Um, and uh, so he as a trainer, and I just was fortunate mm -hmm. to have 
met Lynn way back in 96 Mm -hmm. and uh, we talked and it's kind of a funny story actually I went to his house he invited me to come and meet him and his wife Linda and we talked for hours and I didn't find this out till years later and they didn't like they were like second parents to me and one day we were at a luncheon and one of the students said Lynn how did you meet Lori and he told the story exactly as I remember it but then he ended it with, and then after she left, Linda looked at me and she said, Lynn, you've got to stop inviting these crazy people to our house. <laughs> and, and, and I was like, what? <laughs> she thought I was crazy. And he said, well, the thing was, we thought you were about 25. And I was actually 39 at the time. And I was a new grandmother. Mm. My daughter had married at 18 and I had her when I was 19. So she married at 18 and she had a baby a year later. And, uh, and so I was a grandmother by the time I was 39. So here but. I was telling them about my seven children and my new grandbaby and they thought I was like 25 (laughs) so when I left you know they just thought that poor girl and her imaginary family (laughs) 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 it was pretty funny (laughs) too young to be a grandmother too young to be a grandmother (laughs) yeah but uh, Lynn has been a guest on this program several times. He uses a training method uh, he calls CRV, or Controlled Remote Viewing, and I gather that's the method you learned and that's the method you teach. That is, I teach um, Controlled Remote Viewing, Associative Remote Viewing, and Extended Remote Viewing, Mm -hmm. three different kinds of remote viewing, but my favorite is Controlled Remote Viewing, Mm -hmm. and that's what Lynn really trained me intensively in. Um, I wanted to teach this. I knew from the day that I graduated from my very first basic class that I wanted to teach this someday. Mm -hmm. I was so amazed by it that I was like, what's going to happen to this when you die? (laughs) (laughs) That's a great thing to say to someone. (laughs) And Lynn was like, well, I don't know. know, uh, I don't know who's going to carry it on. And and he had a, you had to sign an agreement when Mm -hmm. you studied with Lynn that you would not attempt to teach it professionally until two years after graduating from advanced class. So I was just getting out of basic when I was thinking I've got to be able to teach this someday. But the main reason he has that here, he had that, had assigned that was because he was seeing a lot of people springing up, going to take, you know, a a three or five day class from somebody Mm -hmm. maybe who wasn't even qualified to teach in the first place, and then hanging out a shingle as an expert. And he was concerned about the morphic field. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if your listeners are familiar with the morphic field, but it's based on the hundredth monkey theory, you know, uh, meeting a uh, critical mass kind of a thing. Where well, it's a concept <laughs> uh, pioneered by the biologist Rupert Sheldrake. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so, essentially, the more people that know something, the easier it is to learn. And so, it's, it's always been a big concern of Lynn's that everyone really learns the right thing and learns it well so that it makes it easier for other people to learn the right mm-hmm. thing. Whereas if you have a bunch of people who don't really know what they're doing and they hang out shingles and a bunch of people are learning all kinds of different ways yeah. and they're all calling it controlled remote viewing, then it becomes kind of a mishmash in the mm-hmm. morphic field as Lynn's. Well, the thing about remote viewing, um, in my experience, is is that on the one hand, it's extremely easy to do. You, uh, many people do it beautifully the very first time without any real preparation or training. And on the other hand, it's very hard to do consistently. Yes. Yes. You know, last night I was, I was holding one of my mentoring clubs. I have these mentoring clubs for my students and I mentor them. And after we got off with the group, I, I stayed on with one particular student who was having a bit of an issue. And he said, well, the thing is, sometimes I do so well and it's, you know, I just get so excited. I'm like, I nailed that target. He said, but I want to do that every time. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, think about a gambler. You know, the first time somebody walks into a casino and makes a big win, they get a huge dopamine rush, Mm -hmm. you know, like, whoa, I just won $11,000. But they don't have, that doesn't happen every time. And that's what creates compulsive gamblers, right? Because they are always after that dopamine rush. And that's how people, I, I have a, uh, an acquaintance that lost everything. She won $11,000 in a casino, went on to become a compulsive gambler, lost everything. Mm-hmm. So I said, so remote viewers are, can be the same way. They can have such an amazing hit that then after that, they're just addicted to that hit. And they want it every time. But there are so many things that can influence. So if I were to give you a target today, and it was a target that 
maybe had was a, a type of thing that you don't view well mm -hmm. because <clears throat> everybody has their superpower, right? So there are some viewers that view people really well, but don't give them a machine because mm -hmm. they can't view that. Other people are just the opposite. They, you know, you could put them at, at Mecca during the pilgrimage when there's millions of people there and they won't see a single person, but they'll describe every building to a T. You know, so it just depends. I mean, if you have social phobia or you don't like people in general, you might not view people that well. Or if you have a fear of blood and there's blood at the target, you just won't see it mm -hmm. because it's just not something you want to look at with your mental eyes as any more than you would with your physical eyes. In, in, in other words, consciousness itself has the ability to access information anywhere in time and space, but it's going to come into your awareness filtered by your own personality. Exactly, exactly. And one example I use is, let's say we had two viewers. One of them was a devout Catholic, and the other one had been molested by a priest, for example, as a child. And I gave them both the same target of a Catholic mass. One viewer would perceive it one way, the other viewer would perceive it the other way, both of their perceptions being colored by their experience and their attitudes towards that target. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's why you always have to take that into account when, as, a, as an analyst or a project manager looking at remote viewing sessions. Mm -hmm. Well, the process of becoming a remote viewer, you're, you're a person, as you explained, with a, a long history of psychic functioning, maybe going back even to infancy. Yes. Uh, but you only really learned remote viewing as an adult after you had training uh, from Lynn Buchanan. What, what kind of experiences were you having prior to that time? Well, um, you know, it's really, really interesting because the night before I discovered remote viewing, the very night before, I was in Denver and I was lying in bed and I was reading a book by a doctor who had done a bunch of studies on children who had gone through a near-death experience. And he followed these children for 20 years, and he and it, it, he noticed that all of the ones who had, he had a bunch of control groups, and he noticed the ones who had had near-death experiences all tended to have a very high degree of psychic ability. And as I was reading this, all of a sudden I had a big aha moment, because I suddenly remembered my mother telling me that when I was a baby, like she, I think she said I was around two, she had uh, gotten me up from my nap and I was sitting in the middle of the living room floor and she was doing something in the kitchen and she turned around and she said, you were flopping on the floor like a fish. And she went running over and she thought I was choking on something. And Mrs. Bartoli, the Hungarian woman who lived in the duplex next door, came running over, picked me up by my feet, was pounding me on the back. They were trying to get it out of my mouth, whatever it was. And, um, and so... In the end, I stopped breathing, I turned blue, my eyes were open, fixed, and glassy, and they rushed me to the hospital, and I was somehow revived there. Mm. I have, of course, no recollection of this incident at all. However, I've been the odd one out in my family. I'm, I'm one of three girls, so my two sisters were always very normal, but I was not normal mm. in, in that I would hear things before they happened. Uh, my mother could be having a conversation on the phone, and I would, could hear the other person in my mind and what they were saying to her. Or I, I, had a, I had multiple precognitive dreams my entire life. And my earliest memories are out-of-body experiences mm. from the time I was very small, dreaming that angels would come. I called them angels, but they were actually three figures in very dark costumes. I mean, a very like dark, long robes. And they could fly. And they would come and I would come out of my body and we would fly together. And I was so little, I didn't have the vocabulary to explain to my mother what I had experienced, but it would happen frequently. And I would try to tell her and I'd say, Mommy, these angels came in the night and they talked to me with their with their minds. We didn't have to use our mouths because we could talk with our minds. And I didn't know what that was, but I thought it was very cool. And they would take me to these classrooms. I remember going to classrooms and learning, but I don't remember what I learned, consciously anyway. And uh, it was it, the funny thing was, though, they never told me they were angels. I would ask mm -hmm. mentally, are you? I remember asking, are you God? And I felt that they thought that was humorous, and they would say, no, we're not God. Mm. Are you the devil? No, we're not the devil. And I'd say, are you angels? And there was just a silence after I asked, are you angels? So when you're a child, silence means yes. <laughs> so I was like, oh, they're angels. Okay. <laughs> so I still to this day, I'm not exactly sure what that was, but it happened quite frequently. And I continued having out-of-body experiences, precognitive dreams, 
um, even some very ghostly, interesting ghostly experiences mm -hmm. uh, my whole life. You had a variety of uh, intense inner experiences, but that's a little distinct from remote viewing. Yes, it is. In fact, um, you know, I have a number of psychics, professional psychics and mediums among my students, along with CEOs of corporations and celebrities and number one New York Times bestselling authors, people like that. But um, interestingly, the psychics who have natural ability and who, who come to me and say, gosh, I've had X, Y, Z happening to me my whole life. Um, for a lot of people who are not professional psychics, but who have natural ability, they find that it's like the tails wagging the dog. Because we tend to fear that which we don't understand. And so sometimes what happens is people just have this spontaneous stuff that's bursting in on their consciousness on a regular basis that they have no control over. Mm -hmm. And so that's the way it was with me. I had no control over any of this stuff. And some of the things could be pretty frightening. So I loved running into CRV because it gave me a really safe platform. I loved that there was science behind it, brain science and research behind it, and that this was something, a step-by-step -step written method that you do with your eyes open, sitting at a desk, writing on a piece of paper, that helps separate imagination from true psychic perception. So, Lori, you've had uh, a wide variety of uh, inner, intense inner experiences of a parapsychological nature, most likely, and uh, you found that to be very different than actual disciplined remote viewing. It is. It is very different. So, a lot of psychics that I talk to are people who come to me with natural ability um, they are frightened by their ability. They have spontaneous experiences that they can't control, like the tail is wagging the dog. And the discipline of CRV, this, uh, you know, a set, structured set of written protocols, you're sitting at a desk, writing on a piece of paper, and you have this step-by-step -step process. There's, it's almost like there's freedom and safety in structure. And it's a safe platform that you can work through and help to get control of that so that you can bring those experiences on demand. You can ac access information on demand, which is great, you know, because we don't want the tail wagging the dog. Mm -hmm. um, so in, other, in other words, a lot of people with natural psychic ability, even professionals, uh, may have never had the opportunity to get uh, – training in, in a disciplined approach. They rely on their natural talent and because there aren't many opportunities for uh, people to uh, engage in disciplined training of this sort. You don't, Certainly colleges and universities and high schools don't offer this. No, I think they should, but they yeah. don't. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe someday. Mm -hmm. But the, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, uh, it's so wonderful to have some safety in that structure. Um, and it really does provide a freedom because a lot of times for natural psychics, they're affected by their emotions so strongly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're having a bad day or you, you had an argument with somebody yesterday that's distracting you, trying to access information about where you left your car keys or what's going on with your children can be really difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, CRV is a wonderful parenting tool. As a mother of seven children, take it from me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, so it can really be tough if you've got this natural ability, but you have no ability to control it. Yep. And that's what CRV does. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, people who are extremely right-brained, like we've all met somebody who's very right-brained. And I think when Lynn met me, I was, I probably fit into this category of, you know, the kind of the ditzy kind of thing where, you know, you're never on time. You can't remember what you did five minutes ago. And, um, you know, just short-term memory is a problem because you have almost like attention deficit disorder, which a lot of natural psychics do have as mm -hmm. a commonly. So the question then is, um, what do you do with those people who are very right-brained who don't adapt easily to structure, to mm -hmm. a written structure? Um, so I actually had a number of students who had had closed head injuries, mm -hmm. and their short-term memory was gone. So they couldn't remember the structure from day to day. And the first thing you do on your very first page of a controlled remote viewing session is you put your name in the upper right-hand corner. By the third day of class, they'd still be like, wait a minute, where do I put my name? You know, how do I begin again? They just couldn't remember. So I created a number of templates. Mm -hmm. And now my students always get the templates that they can actually follow, written templates, so that if they do have a problem with remembering structure or they're very right-brained, 
then they can use the, the templates to guide them. Because if there's no problem with their ability to access psychic information. Their only problem is they don't know how to organize it. And controlled remote viewing is really known as an interview and report methodology. So it's like your conscious mind is interviewing your subconscious mind, which has access to everything that there is in time and space. How interesting. Well, you know, I suppose it's fair to share with our viewers that you are probably the most active remote viewing trainer around today. That is true. I am the most prolific. I have close to a thousand students now that I've taught, and I teach at least once a month, sometimes more than once a month. Uh, at least three day workshops throughout the month. I'm teaching webinars, you know, two hour webinars and mentoring students. Um, and I'm getting ready to now, uh, pr- I'm getting ready to issue a video course, mm-hmm. uh, of the basic class. And then after that, there will be an opportunity to be part of a membership where the people in the membership club will get weekly content that will help bring them through the whole controlled remote viewing process. Mm-hmm. So, Uh, On the one hand, people such as yourself, who have a history of uh, psychic experiences, uh, find the discipline to be refreshing. Yes. On the other hand, people who have had no background whatsoever, who who consider themselves completely (laughs) unpsychic, Uh, can also do remote viewing. That is absolutely right. And le- okay, so we talked about right brain people, you mm-hmm. know, who can be sometimes like, oh, wait, what, what, what was I saying again? Where, where, where am I going? And then there are the left brain people. Like I had a, a student who had gone to MIT and owned his own computer company and came from China. He said, I have zero right brain ability. I have zero psychic ability. I'm completely 100% left brain. If I can do this, Anybody can do it. Mm -hmm. And it's so true. I I want to tell you a story uh, about a man who was, I think he was 77. He took the basic course from me in Vancouver, Canada. And this man was a self-made gazillionaire. I don't know, you know, millionaire, billionaire. I'm not sure what. But he was wealthy. And he had run away from home at 15 and joined the Merchant Marines and had learned to tie knots. And he ended up creating a corporation a shipping corporation that creates the nets that hold the shipping containers on the ships and keep them from falling off Mm -hmm. and that catch the planes as they land on the aircraft carriers, Mm -hmm. you know, those nets. And so he's done very, very well. And uh, in basic class, I was worried about him because I didn't know if he was getting everything, you know, and the other students were doing super well, but he didn't seem the least bit discouraged or perturbed. And I said, are you, you know, are you doing okay? He said, yeah, I can see them having success. I know this works. Mm -hmm. Well, a few months later, I was getting ready to teach an intermediate course in Los Angeles. And he called me and said, I'm Lori, I want to come take your intermediate course. And I was like, oh dear, um, you know, is that going to be okay? I didn't want to take his money if he wasn't able to grasp it. I wasn't sure. Uh, but I had never had a student that hadn't grasped it yet. Mm-hmm. So he said, let me show you what I can do. He could tell I was kind of hedging. So he said, let me show you. Let me just show you what I can do. So he flies to Los Angeles and he sits down and says, give me a target. So I assigned him a target, which, uh, and a target being any photograph in a, you know, hidden in an envelope or whatever. I, I assigned him a target. He nailed the target with perfect structure. And I was shocked. And I said, how did this happen? How did you go from where you were on the last day of basic class to where you are now? He said, well, since I saw you last, not only have I read the manual multiple times, but I've also done over 300 practice sessions. Wow. And what that showed me was that anyone can learn this if they're willing to put in the work. But if it's like a martial to apply art. themselves. If they want to apply because themselves. Because for many people, it's so easy to, to get discouraged when you live in a culture that tells you this stuff isn't real at all. It's impossible. It's true. It's so true. And, you know, Lynn, who's been doing this since, I think, the early 80s, yeah. right? So he has tons of experience. And he says, you know, when I sit down to do a session, I still think to myself, what I'm about to do is impossible. Mm -hmm. It can't be done. (laughs) And of course, he does it with excellence. But, um, you know, it's just funny because we have been told it can't be done. It just can't be done. It's We're doing the impossible. But that makes you wonder, well, if we're doing that thing that's impossible, what else is there out there that we can do? And one thing that is the most exciting part of CRV that I love Mm -hmm. and ERV is that time travel. We're time traveling when we remote view. Controlled remote viewing and extended remote viewing and really associated remote viewing, they're all uh, time machines Mm -hmm. because the time machine is right up here. 
And, and especially with ARV, associative remote viewing, where you're trying to forecast uh, perhaps a horse race or uh, something going on in the financial markets. That's exactly right. ARV, the definition of ARV is the controlled use of time loops. Mm-hmm. You know, so that sounds really out there, Star trek or, you know. <laughs> well, it is. It's a matter of, of, there's no getting around it. Precognition uh, is mind-boggling. It is. It mm-hmm. is mind-boggling. And you were talking earlier about consistency, mm-hmm. that that's one of the most difficult things. And when, you know, you and I both have a mutual friend named Marty Rosenblatt, yes. uh, who runs the Applied Precognition Project. And Marty has been a guest on this program as as well for, in fact, we're, naturally, we have many, many interviews on remote viewing. So <laughs> right. uh, for viewers who are interested in remote viewing, check out our listings. Uh, yeah, it's a new, <laughs> There's a huge archive. <laughs> Thinking Aloud is the, is the place to go to learn about remote viewing. Yeah, so Marty and I met in, I think, 1999 mm-hmm. when uh, Lynn Buchanan and referred Marty to my husband and I, my then husband and I, to do um, some research on precognition. Mm. And uh, he has a company called Precognition, PIA, what does it stand for? Uh, I don't remember what the PIA stands for, but anyway, <laughs> PIA.com, yeah, you'll, right. you'll, if you look it up, you'll find it's, Marty. I think it's a P-I-A dot com. Yes. Right. And... Um, and in Marty, so Marty contacted me. He said, I'm going to do this research on precognition. Would you and your husband like to participate? And I will pay you. And we were just, we said, sure, you know, we'd love to. So what he did was he would, uh, the first experiment we did, he said, I am going to give you four numbers, like uh, four digit numbers, and there's going to be 500 of them, 500 four digit numbers. And I'd like you to create a symbol that stands for animal. Very simple symbol for animal, a very simple symbol for vegetable, and a very simple symbol for mineral. Mm-hmm. And uh, then you just write the four numbers and do a quick, a quick jiggle, and and then look at your jiggle and tell me if you think that is animal, vegetable, or mineral. Now that yeah. jiggle we call an ideogram. An ideogram, an ideogram. yes, <laughs> which is very specific to Lynn Buchanan's CRV methodology. It is very specific to that. So we and it was actually developed by Ingo Swan mm-hmm. when he developed the military method. So. So uh, we developed these three ideograms uh, or symbols, and um, we every day we would both of us would just go through these numbers that Marty would send us, write the f- a four digit number, do a quick symbol, another four digit number, quick symbol, till we had done all five hundred. It took about an hour a day to do five hundred to do five hundred of them in yes. one hour. Yeah, it took My about, yeah, and so after a week, Marty calls and he's so excited. I mean, his voice is trembling. He said, "You and your husband both." accurately predicted the next day's movement of the S&P 500 in the stock market. Well, unfortunately, my ex-husband and I were both former missionaries. And the stock market in our minds at that time was kind of, you know, like gambling. Mm. Gambling, we all know, is of the devil. (laughs) So, you know, so so in, in the next week, we did it again. But this time we knew we were doing, we were trying to predict the motion, the movement of the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. And we had, and he said, he told us when he called us at the end of that first week, do you know how phenomenally above chance this is to be 98% accurate? So the next week he called, he said, this time you were 98% inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And he said, and that is just as phenomenally beyond beyond chance, but not as helpful. (laughs) And and he wrote up a big paper about it in his easing at Mm -hmm. the time. Uh, It was one of his er early articles that he wrote about this phenomena of, you know, there's Sigh hitting and sigh missing. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, so it was just kind of an interesting experience, experiment yeah. with that. So you were a missionary. I was a missionary. And, and, and I presume from what you're saying, that meant you were sort of educated as some kind of religious fundamentalist. Uh, when I was 14, um, just turned 14, my parents moved to Knoxville, Tennessee. And be- prior to that, I was, you know, we were having seances every weekend and we were having really weird poltergeist activity in my house. And so I was starting to learn how to read tarot cards. And we get to Knoxville and it's summertime. I didn't know anyone. I was lonely. And one day my sister felt sorry for me and she said, let me take you to this park and drop you off because there's a band playing there, a free band. So she drops me off at the park. I'm all by myself and I'm sitting on this grass and there's hippies everywhere. Just people in, you know, women in long dresses and long frizzy hair and, and the guys with long hair and everybody's walking around. And I was talking to God. I'm sitting on the lawn saying, okay, God, 
if you're really real, I want you to show yourself to me right now and show me what to believe. And if you do, then I'll follow you. But if you don't, then I'm not going to have anything to do with you and I'm not going to believe in you anymore. Because when you're 14, you're very black and white, right? Mm-hmm. So you just give all ultimatums to God. <laughs> so I gave this ultimatum to God. And right then, these two hippie guys walked by me and then they both stopped suddenly and they turned back around and they came back and they sat down and started talking to me. And they had a little tiny Bible and I asked them questions that I had been asking pastors of churches that the pastors would always respond with. There are some things that God just doesn't mean for us to know or, you know, they'd give this kind of non-answer to answers. Mm. These guys would just flip open the Bible and hand me it and point to a verse and they answered every question I asked them. And so I ended up having a pretty profound experience talking with them for five hours. I asked Jesus into my heart. I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And I seriously though, Jeffrey, that day was a turning point in my life because from that moment on, literally the world looked different through my eyes. So I had this profound religious experience or spiritual experience that transformed me. I still didn't like churches, but I I felt very tied to Jesus from then on. And then I ended up joining that group when I when I got when I gra- I graduated from high school at 16 and joined this group. And some people now call it a cult. And, and you know it's funny because the minute you think cult, you're just like, "Oh no, you poor thing. Oh, you must be traumatized." Uh, but actually, I had a lot of really wonderful and very beneficial to me experiences, and I consider my time in that cult, although there were some negative things, of course, but who doesn't have negative stuff in their lives? Um, I do consider my time in that experience uh, to be what part of what made me who I am today and gave me a lot of survival skills and talents that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, I was, and I traveled all over South America, talking to people about Jesus, playing my guitar, having babies. <laughs> well, it, it sounds like a fairly good life, uh, but it, it, you were indoctrinated into some sort of fundamentalist Christian beliefs. Oh, yes. And uh, after having been engaging in seances and a wide <laughs> variety of other forbidden activities. And uh, so when you return to remote viewing, eventually all of this background, I guess some people would say you you had a lot of baggage at that point. I did. I did. And, and when my students, sometimes when I tell some of my <laughs> stories to my students um, and I'll say, you know, I had a major uh, shift in my remote viewing experience after 11 years of remote viewing. But I say to them, don't think you have to wait 11 <laughs> years to have this shift because you don't have the baggage that I, I had. <laughs> so um, yeah, we came back from being missionaries in 1991 and then I met Lynn Buchanan in 96 mm. and uh, and that whole time I was on a search to try to reconcile the psychic experiences I had had with my belief system at that time of you know kind of black and white you know God and the devil you know Jesus and heaven and hell and you know just it, everything was pretty much in a little box very convenient um, and remote viewing blew that out of the water in a way because your God box blows wide open and you start discovering God is a lot bigger than you thought he was when you get into remote viewing. But um, the interesting thing is that this whole experience was a path. We're all on a path that leads us exactly where we need to go. Mm-hmm. And I feel that my experience as a missionary, of course, prepared me. But when I went into the mission work, I renounced seances and ghosts and and psychic, all that stuff, I just decided it has to be of the devil. Mm. And I thought that just simply by renouncing it, it would go away. But oh no, <laughs> things don't work that way. And instead, it became stronger and stronger and stronger. And I had more and more and more paranormal experiences that I kind of had to sit on and be careful how I framed those experiences. And just to give you an example, in John chapter 4 of the New Testament, Jesus speaks to the woman at the well and essentially gives her a psychic reading. <laughs> if you read that chapter, Jesus gives a woman a psychic reading. But you don't, you know, in churches, they never say that. They, you know, Jesus gave her a word of prophecy or whatever you want to call it. But it's just semantics. Mm. Because really, all throughout the Bible are all sorts of paranormal things, precognitive dreams and, and visions and ghosts and, you know, you name it. It's all in the Bible. So, um, but, but yet, while I was there on the mission field, I was really trying to suppress this stuff, unless it was done through prayer and you could say, okay, I just prayed and the Lord showed me X, Y, Z. Uh, so coming back, I was like, okay, that stuff never went away. Therefore, it can't be evil. 
And finding Lynn Buchanan's website in 1996 that said, what is CRV? When I read what he had in there, I went, wow, this is an explanation I can really, I knew this was my answer to reconciling these different dichotomies because he explained that as humans, we all have natural psychic ability. We're born with it. Some people suppress it better than others or have it suppressed for them, but we all have it. And it's no different than your eyesight or your hearing or anything other, any other sense that you have. So it's no more evil than your ability to see or hear. Now, I understand that uh, the approach that you use, the CRV method, enables you to really remain focused while you're working on a target. It's not a one-shot sort of close my eyes, see what comes up, but you keep going back again and again and again to look at the target from uh, different perspectives. Exactly. And the structure of controlled remote viewing is set up in such a way that the structure itself acts almost like a monitor guiding you to different aspects of the target. Because for a lot, you know, to use this in applications that are really meaningful, like I'll give you an example. We had an archaeologist uh, that had been spending, he'd spent 40 years of his life looking for artifacts in a 200 square mile area of ocean. And he said, I've worked with psychics before, you know, they haven't helped me much. Uh, you know, uh, he, no, he said, I've worked with remote viewers before. He mm-hmm. said, I worked with remote viewers. They haven't helped me. And so we had 14 professional remote viewers. We just gave them blank maps and told them to remote view the area of most interest to the tasker, who was the archaeologist, and just said, the target is a location. Describe the target. They had no idea it was ocean. They didn't know what was being sought. They just knew the target was a location. Describe the target. The first thing that happened was that all 14 remote viewers reported a tower-like thing that looked like a radio tower, some kind of a tower. Now, we knew this was out in the ocean, so we're thinking, why are they all reporting that? So we go back to the archaeologist and said, they're all reporting some kind of tower. He said, oh, yeah, about a mile off of uh, outside of this this area, there's a big naval radio, floating radio tower. Mm-hmm. So we're like, oh, okay. So then we knew they were all on target, and they all returned their maps and gave us you know, pages and pages of information. And we created a very professional-looking report for this man and gave it to him. And he calls me, literally shaking. He said, oh, my God, I have never worked with remote viewers. I've worked with psychics, but I've never worked with remote viewers. And so he took a boat and divers, and they found the artifacts that he had been looking for for 40 years, exactly where we said in the exact GPS coordinates we gave him, and exactly what we told him he would find. He found walls, pillars, archways, inscriptions on stone. I mean, you name it, it's there. And they're still in the process of pulling this up. And he and I are in touch now, and we're getting ready to bring this out into the open. So you're using a consensus methodology in that case with multiple viewers. Multiple viewers, yes. And we did use a consensus methodology. Now, there's there's different types of ways of going at things. Consensus isn't always the best way. Mm -hmm. Remember the Washington sniper case? No. Oh, Uh, yes, 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 of course I do. The Washington sniper case where, you know, these guys are going around in a car shooting out the back. An older man and a younger boy. Right, Mm -hmm. and killing people. Um There was a remote viewing thing. This was before I was a professional remote viewer. I was still a student at this time, I think. But there was a, um, there were a bunch of remote viewers working on that project. I didn't work on it. But nine of them said that there were, they didn't know what the target was. They were just told the target is an event, I believe. Or maybe they weren't told anything. I don't Mm -hmm. remember now. But I just know that nine viewers said there was a red vehicle and one viewer said, that the vehicle's blue. Mm. Now, the one viewer who said the vehicle was blue was the only viewer among them that was Lynn Buchanan's student. Mm. And Lynn keeps data on his students. He has them turn data sheets in so he can track how well they're doing and they have a track record. And that guy who said the car was blue had like 98% accuracy in colors Mm -hmm. over hundreds of sessions. Mm -hmm. So you would put more weight on his thing than on these other nine untested viewers who were saying, no, it's red, mm-hmm. even though you had nine saying it's red. So that's, uh, that's not consensus, uh, but that's more statistical. Mm-hmm. 
So, Maybe a more sophisticated a, a, approach is to have background data on the strengths and weaknesses of each viewer. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's so helpful to have that because that's really data is what separates us from Madame Minerva in the gypsy tent. And just for your listeners, Madame Minerva is my alter ego that my kids call me <laughs> Madame Minerva. But <laughs> it's, but Madame Minerva in the gypsy tent, you know, you could, how do you know she's any good? Well, you know, but maybe word of mouth. People say, mm -hmm. hey, you should go see Madame Minerva. She's, she told me this and it came true. Yeah. But with, with data, you could say, you know, we're going to use this particular viewer on this particular target because this viewer has a very high uh, rate of accuracy in this particular area. Which is precisely as I understand it, what Lynn himself was doing at Fort Meade. He was keeping the statistics back then on the uh, U.S. Army remote viewing team. Exactly. And the great thing now, because back then, even though he had those that data, even though he had those statistics, um, if they had like a hostage crisis, literally a general could walk in and just say, remote viewers, we got a problem, get to it, you know? Mm -hmm. Excuse me, and it was kind of like buckshot. Yeah. Everybody did it, regardless of strengths or weaknesses. Whereas nowadays, we have teams that we can task according to strengths. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to training, we can train you to strengthen your weaknesses because we know what they are. And then when it comes to tasking you with professional, as a professional, we can task you based on your strengths. And it greatly increases the level of accuracy. Mm -hmm. So we're able to stand on the shoulders of these men who went before us and pioneered this in the military. And now we've learned from them and we can take it from there and go, Mm -hmm. Go on, you know, and carry it beyond. So I g gather from what you're saying that it's the case that in addition to training remote viewers, you are also involved in some of these applied projects and uh, there, therefore you're finding opportunities for the people who you train to get involved in these projects. Yes, that's, that's really exciting. You know, the, the third day of my base, after I, after I finished basic class, Lynn was driving my husband and I to the airport. And I said, what is your vision? What is your dream? And he said, my dream would be to have a cadre of excellent remote viewers in a complete team with a project manager and a director and monitors and report writers and analysts and viewers. And, and that dream became my dream. And now, uh, you know, many, many years later, I've been training now, I've been training viewers since 2001. So I guess I'm not, what, 18 years at the time of this filming yeah. of training and of training other viewers. And these viewers now, I have a, a cadre of excellent, like ninja-like remote viewers that I work with on a regular basis. And I now recently have come, uh, come into contact with a very wonderful source of excellent remote viewing projects. Um, that not only have viewers, but you also need research teams who can provide excellent feedback for the viewers that's well researched and documented. Mm -hmm. Because if all we ever give viewers is, you know, view the, the planet Zircon in the galaxies of whatever in the, you know, then if there's no feed feedback, then yeah. they can kid themselves and go, you know, I, I am the world's best remote viewer, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and they can kid themselves that way. But what we like it doing is training our viewers on what we call hard targets, targets with provable feedback that, that they can then score themselves or we can score them mm -hmm. and, uh, and really see strengths and weaknesses and really give them the, the feedback that says, here's what you did really well and here's what you need to work on. Well, for the last uh, 20 years or so since the founding of the International Remote Viewing Association, it struck me that what, what you have is sort of a whole collection of cottage industries. And I think what I hear you saying is it's moving now to a, another level. It is. It is moving to another level. And people that aren't involved don't know that. You mm -hmm. know, they, they'll just say, well, whatever happened to, uh, I, I think I even made a joke at that, at that presentation in Vegas that you saw where, you know, if people haven't heard of you for a long time, they just, they just think you're like one of these entertainers mm -hmm. in Vegas that you see and you go, is he still alive? You know, is he, God, he must be a hundred by now. I can't believe he's still performing. You know, you just think it died on the vine, but mm -hmm. no, it's very active. And there's uh, one company that I'm super excited about is Gail Hughes. Six, uh, Husick Group LLC. Gail is a Harvard educated attorney and uh, very just, I mean, scary smart, one of these scary smart people. And um, she uses a lot of my professional viewers in, uh, as viewers for her, but um, she gets top notch uh, targets. Uh, you know, like very, sometimes very high profile situations that are going on and they, they know to contact 
uh, her company because it will be excellent, excellent results. And, um, and when I asked Gail, I had her on my mentoring club as a guest not too long ago. And I said, Gail, now you work with professional remote viewers, uh, some of whom are my students. I said, do you work with other people? And she said, sometimes I work with um, professional psychics or natural psychics who contact me. But I usually, what I do is I'll give them test targets to, you know, I give everybody that approaches me test targets to see where their strengths and weaknesses lie and if they have the abilities that I need for my company. Because she's trying to carry a high standard of mm-hmm. accuracy. And uh, she And I said, well, what's the difference? What have you seen as the difference between a professional... Or a remote viewer who's gone through training and has that discipline versus maybe a natural psychic who just has really great natural ability. And she said, here's the difference. She said, I'll give them a target and, and the natural psychic will give me two or three pages of very good information. Usually it's very brief and it's usually general, but it's usually accurate and may have a sketch accompanying it that's also helpful. And then she said, the professionally trained remote viewers will give me maybe a 50 page professionally done report with a typed summary with sketches and diagrams that is loaded with information. And she said, and a big difference is I didn't have to retask them to say, okay, you told me about this. Now can you tell me about that? Mm -hmm. Because they're so professionally trained, they automatically know to go from this to that and from that to that and from that to that, and then talk about the relationship between these things and how they relate to each other. That's impressive. I wasn't aware that remote viewers are turning in 50-page reports. Oh, yes. Yes. I, I should have brought some reports to show you. <laughs> yes. And, um, they, and they can type, too. Yes. <laughs> they, they can even type. They can, you know, it's interesting, too, because even when I have students who tell me, Lori, I can't draw a straight line. I can't sketch. So I'm not going to be able to sketch the target. Mm-hmm. You'd be amazed at what they're able to do using ideograms. I tell them, it's okay. I'll teach you how to do ideogrammic targets. And the great thing too is that even if you can't draw a straight line, if you're able to put some marks on a piece of paper and tell yourself, okay, this represents the target to me, Mm -hmm. even if it doesn't look like anything, you can actually touch that sketch and get information from it. Because controlled remote viewing is a very physical discipline. Mm -hmm. We call it a physical yet mental martial art. And since the body is the link between conscious and subconscious minds, then the body actually gets information by touching something that represents the target. Like psychometry. Like psychometry, Mm -hmm. exactly. So if I wanted to, for example, we could grab a piece of paper, scrunch it up into a ball, and say, okay, this is Jeffrey. And now I'm going to touch this scrunched up ball, and I'm going to try to pick up information about Jeff. (laughs) Now, that isn't controlled remote viewing, but it's a technique that you can use that you can then incorporate into the Mm -hmm. controlled remote viewing structure. Uh, fascinating. And I know with your background in hypnosis, you must have a uh, hundred different techniques. <laughs> <laughs> I, there, there's a lot. And, you know, I got a lot of techniques from remote viewing that I incorporated into my hypnosis practice mm-hmm. that really helped a lot of people. They, I, it seems to me the two pr- uh, practices are very complementary. They are very complementary. They really support each other yeah. very, very well. But now, uh, for a remote viewer to be at a point where they can produce a 50-page professional report for a client. How much training is is required? I'm going to guess at least two or three years. I would say that, yes. And uh, of course, some people progress faster than others. Um, And and that's not, and the thing is, if you were a a trainee and you were not progressing as fast as you wanted and you were discouraged, what I would tell you is, hey, you know, you can't, you can't force the baby, Mm -hmm. right? You know, when you have a baby, you can't say, hey, hey, kid, hurry up and learn to talk. Hey, hey, kid, hurry up and learn to walk, right? Because the baby is going to progress at his or her own speed. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with the subconscious. And and what we're really getting here is that the subconscious mind, if it were the baby, um, the subconscious mind is going to progress and grow at its own speed. But I've come to believe that the subconscious mind is not the baby, that the baby is actually the relationship that you're developing between conscious and subconscious minds. Because what CRV allows you to do and what ideograms allow you to do is open the door between conscious and subconscious because they don't speak the same language. 
they're living in the same body, but they don't communicate with each other very well. So what we're doing with controlled remote viewing is we're trying to open that door and allow a conversation to begin taking place mm-hmm. so that they can become develop a really strong, friendly partnership with each other. You know, I've done several interviews with uh, Adam Crabtree uh, looking at the history of uh, hypnosis mesmerism back oh. in the 18th century. And it, what he said is uh, f- was fascinating to me. The early researchers discovered Discovered much to their amazement is that it's as if when it comes to the subconscious, it's like an alien being in, inside of us. It's like everybody is really two different people. It is true. I agree. I agree. Lynn, Lynn says, you know, it's that, that he's, he feels pretty shy and he's not comfortable with people, but that his subconscious loves people. And one of his strengths in the military unit was describing people mm-hmm. and, and discussing the plans and intentions of world leaders. Mm-hmm. And, um, I'm, pretty gregarious and I love people and my one of my strengths as a remote viewer is describing people um, and I can really count on that you know or as Lynn would say you know when Lori describes a person you can take it to the bank you know mm. well um, there are other people who find that there is a pretty strong dichotomy. I mean, even if you think about addiction, for example, you know, like, why do I want to have that other cigarette when I don't want it, you know, but I can't help but have it? Because I used to do a lot of cigarettes, you know, stop smoking, uh-huh. s- smoking cessation and, <laughs> and weight loss yeah, and things yeah. And when I was had my uh, hypnosis business. So, but why do we reach for the thing we're addicted to when we don't want it yeah. consciously? Because the subconscious is much stronger. And 99.999% of who you are is actually rumbling away under the hood where you're not even aware of it. Hmm. We call that the lemon, the, 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 um, mem, let's call it a membrane, the, Mm -hmm. the invisible membrane that separates awareness from unawareness. Mm -hmm. We call that the lemon and everything below it is subliminal. 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 Everything above it is superliminal. Mm -hmm. And so that, uh, lemon, how do you get through the lemon, you can't break through it and just, you know, bash your way through it. The only way th- around it is through the body. Mm-hmm. And so the body becomes that link, that amazing link. The body. The body. I mean, a lot of people might think, oh, being a remote viewer, you're in your head all the time. But you're saying, no, you're going to be in your body. You're going to be in your body and you're paying attention to your body because you never know what might have meaning. So, for example, I was a, when I was still a, a, a new student at this, uh, and my husband and I were going to do a practice session, and we had just had dinner, and we're sitting at the table, and he had, he had chosen a target for me, and I was working on this target, and suddenly I felt ill, and I, I started feeling very dizzy, and I started feeling like maybe I was going to throw up. And I thought, something I just had for dinner must not have agreed with me. Mm. So I said, I need to write down break. And I wrote down, I'm feeling kind of sick. I'm going to go lie down. Um, I wrote that on my paper because you want to write down your break and your break times. And so I went and I laid down because we were in our bedroom. And I I laid down on the bed and and my then husband was sitting there and he didn't move, which wasn't like him. He he, he wasn't a patient kind of guy. So he just sat there for a few minutes and then he said, you can come back now. And I said, what? He said, it's not you. It's the target. And I said, what? He said, it's not you. It's the target. So I come back and I sit down and I finish the session. I instantly felt better. So I did, I finished the session and the target turned out to be like the, the tallest roller coaster in the world or something or the biggest roller coaster in the world. And at that time I had a serious fear of heights. Oh. And so Lynn was giving me a lot of height targets, airplanes, hot air balloons, yeah. uh, you know, trapeze artists, um, you know, roller coasters. And this was one of those targets that Lynn had. So, and it literally made you a little nauseous. It literally made me nauseous. On another target that I did, where uh, the target was on Mars, and um, and we were at my my husband Jim, my current husband Jim, uh, his parents lived in Alamogordo, New Mexico at that time, which is also where Lynn happens to live. And so we were staying with his parents, and I was helping Lynn during the day with a class that he was teaching, and we were working on this paid project. And I was actually paid to do this project, so I was really wanted to be diligent and be very accurate and very good. And as soon as I started the the, pro- the target, as soon as I went into the session, I I felt like I was in a place. I had like a bilocation experience, and there were high high winds, and it was intensely cold. Now his parents, my husband's parents, were elderly, and they didn't like to turn on the air conditioner. And I was going through menopause, so I was having hot flashes all the time, and and I hated going there because I was always sweating and hot. So his menopausal hot flash wife was sitting there in the chair with lips turning blue, teeth chattering, and just freezing cold. Oh, and so, 
And so he went and got and wrapped me up in a blanket and I was really, really cold and I was having a physical reaction to the target. And so they, I found it's very fascinating. Some people do have very strong physical. So reactions. was the target uh, something that would engender coldness? Well, Mars is very cold. <laughs> oh, oh, I was yeah. on Mars, oh, so oh, oh, yeah. Mars was quite cold. And I wasn't there in present time. I was there, who knows how many millennia in in back? Oh, uh, probably I million, uh, maybe a million or two years ago. Uh, I, I see. I was on Mars very long ago, and the and the uh, climate was very very hot. One of those targets that you're not going to get immediate feedback on. Uh, right, one of those <laughs> targets I would not get immediate feedback on. I did get some feedback though, however, that showed that some of the things that I got mm -hmm. were very very highly accurate. Yeah. Well, Lori Williams, I know we could talk for a long time because you have incredible passion for the wor work that you do, and we will have further conversations. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been a real pleasure being with you. Thank you for coming to Albuquerque and being with me. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.